Hi everybody and welcome to the Dr. Psych Mom Show. Today we're going to be talking about when there's an elephant in the room of your relationship and uh, how this usually means that you're settling for a lack of real connection with this person and you don't really want to think about it. Uh, please do subscribe though. The most recent episode was there's a kind of porn that can help with sex lives and the one that's going to be coming up is when you're arrogant or condescending, often the only way your wife can assert herself is by not having sex with you. Um, so that is a real important one for you guys who have been called arrogant or condescending by your wives or for women listening to discuss with a husband or to learn about themselves as to why your sex life may not be good if your husband is a prick. Anyway, uh, moving on to today. So there are often these elephants in the room of relationships, by which I mean there's an issue that the couple does not really discuss, but it is a very awkward, like silent, known variable, sometimes only known by one person, though. And here are some of the examples that I see. Firstly, that the per one person is not attracted to the other person, really never has been. Sometimes it's that one person is no longer attracted to the other person. Sometimes it's that you don't really find your partner that smart or interesting or funny or whatever it is that they think that you find them. Uh, sometimes it's that there's no sex, like you're not having sex at all and you never talk about it and there's no sexual connection or sex goes badly or there's ED, erectile dysfunction or female anorgasmia or what have you. So yeah, some so a lot of the time there's this elephant in the room and people, once they get divorced, if they get divorced, will go back and say, I never felt right in that relationship. There was always this thing going on in the back. You know, I could never fully get over that like X, Y, Z. If you are feeling this and you're dating, you should get out. You should just get out. You should not be in this relationship. You don't deserve to feel like this. The kind of people who end up feeling like this are adult children of dysfunctional families because they always had a secret. The secret is that the family is crazy, at least one person. So adult children of alcoholics are used to hiding things. They're used to having double lives. Same thing with adult children of somebody who's very uh, angry, uh, a hoarder, a, somebody with PTSD, depression, anxiety, whatever. If there's at least one parent whose behavior you could not share to the world and it was known that you couldn't share that, then you're upset with having a double life forever until you go to therapy and work on it or work on it without therapy, whatever. But you got to understand that to work on it and therapy can help with that. So if you're an adult child of a dysfunctional family, then you are used to having a secret a family secret that we cannot tell. So then it's very easy to get into these kind of relationships. And like people who marry, people who end up being gay are often have this kind of background because it's like they always knew that the sex wasn't there. They always knew the chemistry wasn't there. They saw sometimes even the way that the partner would look at people of their same sex and they just averted their eyes because it, it, they're used to having an elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, for example, is mommy doesn't leave the house. Mommy has terrible agoraphobia, won't leave the house, we don't talk about it. Somehow we just tell everybody mommy's sick or mommy's tired. Or daddy's an alcoholic. Or mommy beats the shit out of us. Or whatever. So people who end up in these situations often have, uh, uh, they came by naturally their ability to have a double life. And this is very upsetting when you think about it. Because think about how, you don't have to think about it, you probably lived it, being a child who can't tell anybody what's going on. But now you've replicated it. So it's even more sad. You've replicated it as an adult and you can't tell anybody what's going on. And everybody says, oh, are you so excited for your wedding coming up? And you're like, oh, yeah, it's so exciting. We're so happy. We're looking forward to it. And meanwhile, like, you haven't had sex with this guy in like six months. You know, his video game addiction, he's up until like four in the morning. He's drinking all the time. Or, you know, it's your wife, she's incredibly anxious, she's super cold to you, she's on and off, she cries for no reason, you don't know what the fuck's going on, you think that she's like, um, does something, you don't really know, but you don't think about it. She has some kind of mental illness, we don't really think about it, we don't put it in those terms. I see people like this all the time time that they were ignoring big big red flags during the courtship and got married anyway and guess where I see that therapy right because this shit does not go away so how do you deal with this then if you're married and there's always been an elephant in the room then you got to go to therapy and the way that therapy can really help in this situation particularly because you know I've said therapy isn't for everybody maybe you could just journal 
In this case, when there's an elephant in the room, you need to tell another human being. That's like a key part of the healing and getting shit out there. When there is a big fucking elephant in the room, you got to tell somebody. So even just coming, that changes the whole frame because you were never allowed to do that as a kid. So when you come in and you say to a therapist, our problem is that we haven't had sex in a year. It's like you could see the relief, honestly, on the person's face, at least the one who's talking. Because it's like they don't tell that to anybody. They probably haven't even spoken it out loud in their relationship. There are people, of course, who have many problems that they discuss in the relationship. And there's, there's, there's a couple levels. There's people who have problems that they discuss with uh, somebody else and also with each other. They're like the best. Of course, this is this is not good <laughs> to have this level of problems. But if you're going to have big problems, it's best that like there's somebody else you talk to. So like, let's say the girl talks to her sister. Oh, my husband and I haven't had sex in six months. What do you think is wrong? And she talks to the husband. Why don't we have sex anymore? All right, fine. This is a best case scenario if you're going to have a problem. At least you're not you don't have a secret on top of a problem. And as anybody, well, I don't know what anybody knows about sexual abuse, but that's the worst part of it frequently is not the abuse itself, is the secret. The secret, it eats at people. So when I was working as a younger person, as an intern with uh, children that had been sexually abused, I talk about this periodically in my podcast. We use trauma-focused CBT where you actually draw out this story. Like they make like a book and they talk about the sexual abuse that happened. Scene by scene, you may say, that is crazy but it works it helped it's the opposite of a secret we're literally talking about it we're saying and then what happened and where and you know you have to have a good therapeutic alliance you have to build a lot of trust with the child and then you write out everything that happened and you write a story and then they tell the story to hopefully their new foster parents or adoptive parents or sometimes the counselor in the group home that they're close to it was sad situation group home but you know it's it's better than still staying in that situation that they were in prior to that. Anyway, uh, the reason that this is very transformative and curative is because there's no more secret. So they're, yeah, they're the kid that had that bad thing happen, but it's out there. And they know that at least one person is proud of them for telling their story and does not think that they are somehow broken, wounded, damaged, or less than because of it. Because, of course, the group home counselor or especially a a new foster parent or whoever, in addition to the therapist, of course, says, I'm so proud of you that you did such a good job on your story and you were so brave and this is a really good thing, et cetera, et cetera. So, in fact, they're getting positive validation for sharing their story. So this is, this is the opposite of having a horrible secret gnawing at you. So you can use this analogy as an adult. If you come in and you finally say to a therapist, uh, for example, you know, um, my spouse calls me bad names and we're not allowed to talk about it. You know, we, we don't talk about it. Then you did talk about it. You talked about it to somebody and somebody says, well, that's really terrible. That's not okay. I want to work with you on getting into a different dynamic and, you know, figuring it out. Then you finally, it's, you feel wonderful in a sense. Yeah, you still have the problem, but you don't have the secret on top of the problem, which can really just destroy you having a secret like this. I see it with children of hoarders, you know, adult children of hoarders always recount how difficult it was because they always had to make up reasons that nobody could visit their house. It was always a different reason. And it, it's just crazy. It just kills you. Same with alcoholics, same with drug addicts. Everything, I mean, is similar. So anyway, the point is, If you have an elephant in the room in your marriage, the first thing you got to do is talk to somebody about it. Frequently having no sex or terrible sex or weird sex, you know, I don't mean like kinky sex. I mean, weird sex in that, like, for example, like you're just, you just masturbate separately and nobody talks about why you're not allowed to touch each other, you know, um, or something. I don't talk, I'm not talking about when it's hot, that you masturbate together. This is not the situation. Um, the, the, the point is when there's a big secret or the secret is that like you have no love, like there's no love. You haven't said I love you in years and years and years you, and you don't know if you feel it. Or uh, uh, just a million things that your, that your spouse is an alcoholic, that your spouse is addicted to something, that your spouse is, you know, uh, very, very depressed and we're not allowed to talk about it, you know, whatever. So the first thing to do is to get into therapy. If they won't come to couples, you got to get into individual and at least have one human being that you talk to about this. If you want and you're religious, go talk to a pastor about it. It's, it's better than keeping it to yourself. You know, of course, I'm biased toward therapy. Therapy isn't for everybody, though. So you got to talk to some human. Maybe you could talk to a friend or, or a family member if you if you can't even think about going to a therapist. But a therapist is very objective and obviously trained. So I put that 
that higher in terms of what you need to deal with <laughs> right now in terms of getting your ducks in a row. And the therapist will often tell you, yeah, you got to tell other people too, you know, like family, like somebody. And if you have children, this is extremely important. Yeah, the children don't know shit about your sex life, fine. But if your secret, if your elephant in the room is like mommy or daddy's, your spouse being mommy or daddy's, or you, you being mommy or daddy, the mental illness of this person then you are training your kid to lead a double life and you can't do it anymore. So you can't say to your kid, we don't tell anybody what goes on in this house implicitly or explicitly. You're just telling them they're going to have anxiety or depression later on and probably be estranged from you from anger towards you about having to keep something hidden. So if your elephant in the room is that your spouse has a drinking problem, you, that cannot be. You just got to, today could be your day to say, you know what, I'm going to go to an Al-Anon meeting and I'm going to finally talk to somebody else who understands about my spouse being an alcoholic and I'm going to think about getting my kids into therapy for this because we can't ignore it anymore no matter what my spouse does or doesn't do about their addiction. So that could be a thing that you resolve. So if it is not such a huge, um, eh, not huge, everything's huge in its own way, but if it is not something that your children readily observe, such as an intimacy deficit, such as let's go back to the one that you're not attracted to your spouse. Let's even go to the one where you used to be and now you're not. So, the, so, so uh, this is, a, again, higher level problem. It isn't that you were never attracted to your spouse, but that you just stopped being attracted to your spouse because let's say they put on 50 pounds. Very common situation I see in practice. So... At this point, you should turn to your spouse and say, I mean, I know you're not going to right now, but this could be the first step in like, you know, starting the chain of reaction that eventually you would. Turn to your spouse and say, you frequently ask why we don't have sex. And I say, I don't know. I think it's me. I, it, is, it is not fully me. It could be me too. You know, I'm going through my perimenopause, right? But it isn't fully me. The number one thing is your weight gain. And I'm sorry, and I, I'm sorry to say it. I know it may sound harsh. I didn't want to lie to you anymore. I wanted to give you the ability to potentially deal with this situation because that is why I cannot have sex with you. And I have um, an article about this, or many posts actually, about this on my site. This guy says that his wife is obese. His mother, his abusive mother used to be obese. He just cannot deal with obesity. He's told the wife before, and nothing changes. Uh, I don't know if she can change anything or, or what. I mean, I'm not saying like she's being, uh, you know, malicious in her weight gain. Certainly not. But in this situation, he told her she couldn't do it. And then he had to get out of the relationship. And I don't say no. Why? I mean, I think in this situation it was more than 50 pounds. Either way, if you have to get out of a relationship because of something that, uh, you know, it doesn't ideally sound great to the world, but you know that like you can never be with this person because of this, then you have to. But you've got to be honest with them first because maybe it is a situation where they don't really know the extent of how upset you are about this. Now, we're talking like, like uh, as you, uh, I'm sure, have not listened to every single podcast I ever made. Maybe you have. There was a situation where there was this guy who wrote in. And he said, I can't call my wife beautiful uh, because she gained weight and, um, and uh, she's so, so she's not beautiful. She's just hot. I have sex with her and she wants me to call her beautiful, but I can't. I could just call her hot. If you still have sex with her and you still think she's hot, then you're just being a dickwad, not calling her beautiful. And you got to go to your own individual therapy to stop being a dick. But that's a whole different situation than this one with the elephant in the room where the weight gain is a thing that makes you unable to like sleep with the person, touch the person, look at the person. And there are people like that, especially like this guy who had an obese, abusive mother. And so he's triggered by it, whatever. So the the point is you got to give your spouse the possibility of changing something or at the very least, just the respect. This is your spouse. This is not like in my preceding podcast where I was like, listen, sometimes if you just want to fade out after dating somebody off the Internet for a couple times, you know, it's not terrible. And some people would even prefer to be ghosted than to be told I wasn't actually very physically attracted to you after all right so that's a situation you don't know that person shit really this though is a situation where it's your spouse you owe your spouse some honesty and respect the honesty and respect in this case is we have to talk about x x is the reason everything is bad now what about you're gonna say in the situation where you really have never been attracted to your spouse and there's no coming back well, then I think, and I talked about this in its own podcast about when you've never been attracted to your spouse, I think is literally the title. Um, it, I, you got to tell them because they deserve maybe to be with somebody who could be in love with them possibly. That's what I think. 
If you can't, if you can't fake it, if you cannot act like you're in love with them and you're in love with them for the sake of your kids or for whatever, which some people can do. It's not my, I mean, you know, that's not what I would do, but it's, it's, it's some people want to do it. And it's like a philosophical question, like if a tree falls in the forest, like if a woman is so committed to having an intact, happy home that she can fake for her entire life, <laughs> being in passionate love with her husband till the day that he dies, <laughs> then I mean, I don't know, like it really is a philosophical question and outside the purview of this podcast, possibly for philosophical podcast about whether she did anything wrong. I don't think she did do anything wrong because she got her goals met and she made him feel good same really as when I work with uh, parents who can't bond to their child so parents who never through their usually it's because of a dysfunctional very dysfunctional abusive family of origin they cannot bond to their child right and I work with mothers like this this is some of the most rewarding work because it's never happened that they haven't cultivated a better relationship after we work together with the child because I let them fake it so I'm like you're not doing anything bad right now your child doesn't know because frequently they're the most conscientious and assiduous of mothers because they're so anxious that the child who doesn't deserve to not be loved will pick up on that they're not loved and so we work on of course how could you be a loving mother look at the experience that you had also you have postpartum depression also you were going through a bunch of shit at the time of the pregnancy but you're not doing anything wrong you're being a good mother right now you are doing everything right if you have to fake it till the day that you die you will have been a good mother this is true you will have been a good mother you will have done that out of the love that you're telling me you don't feel you don't feel like this romanticized love but obviously you feel the level of love that you can behave the right way towards your child and that is love and, you know, it's, it's something that you got to work on. But often after the people fake it, then they start to feel the love in some way for the child. And then it grows and grows. So this is just an aside, uh, something that is, um, you know, something that could be like something that somebody hears. And it's like, wow, that is something I'm struggling with that I didn't know I would get to hear about. But anyway, the point is that your spouse deserves to hear about the elephant in the room. You should not live a lie if it's tearing you apart. You should not be somebody who ever tells your child that they must lie about some elephant in the room of the family if that is what's going on. And therapy can help with all of this stuff because probably the reason you're doing this is because you had to lead a double life as a kid. So hopefully you got a lot out of this podcast. This one went various directions around the, around the mulberry bush, but hopefully uh, most of it was interesting to you. If not, what was it? 17 minutes of your life. <laughs> all right. Talk to y'all soon. Bye-bye.